throughout the book of John so far as we've been reading and studying verse by verse has made the comment, I will not be with you much longer. And uh, can you imagine the feeling that these disciples have in the pit of their stomach as they're hearing Jesus talk about leaving, as they hear Jesus say, I'm going somewhere and you can't follow. He said that so far in the book of John at least three times. And the reason he's saying that is because he's getting ready to go to the cross and he knows that his time is nearing the end. And he constantly says, you're not going to have me much longer. You're not going to have me that much longer. Can you imagine how they feel getting ready to lose their leader? The man that they've been following for the past three, about three and a half years. They've been following Jesus everywhere that he goes. They've been listening to everything that he preaches. They've been uh, doing everything that Jesus has told them to do. And he keeps saying, I'm getting ready to leave. Where I'm going, you can't go. Don't you hate to hear that? I'm moving away. And I'm going somewhere and you can't follow me. You gotta go where you gotta go where God leads you. And sometimes that hurts, but that's the feeling that we get here. Now he said it at the celebration of Lazarus in chapter number twelve. He said, You have the poor always when uh when Judas was criticizing uh Mary Magdalene about worshiping at his feet. He, he said, you should give this money somewhere else. Give it to the poor. They're more important than worship. And uh, Jesus said, you have the poor always. Here we are 2,000 years after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what we still have? We still have poor people. Amen. One of them. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm rich in Jesus. Amen. But uh, now Jesus it says, I'm getting ready to leave. He says in chapter 13, he said, I'll only be with you for a little while. They did not understand at that time he was talking about his death on the cross. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, can you imagine, because he didn't clearly say I'm getting ready to die. <coughs> Nowhere has he said that yet. He just keeps saying I'm leaving and you can't follow me. So my first thought, if somebody's leaving and I can't follow them, that means that they're moving away. They're going to kind of just drop me off and, you know, do whatever they're going to do for the rest of their life. But Jesus is not talking about, he's talking about actually leaving. I don't know about you, but if my best friend was leaving me, I'd be pretty discouraged. I'd be pretty upset. I remember being a child and we moved a lot. And over that time, I'd get a lot of girlfriends. My wife, she's laughing. She's not laughing. The rest of y'all actually believe it, don't you? Nope. We don't. <laughs> That's why y'all ain't laughing. Uh, but I, I, you, you'd leave, uh, move from one house to another, and usually it was a different city, so you'd have to move schools and when you move schools you moved you lost friends and sure you talked to your friends for a few days after that but after a few days you know you found new friends that hurt you get over that hurt and all through life it's been that way we've had to do things that we necessarily didn't want to do but that god was leading us i think of when we left midview uh to come here uh how upset not because we were coming here we were excited to come here i'm still excited to be here but we were discouraged and upset because we had to leave those that we loved. You know, you see your church family more than you see your own family most of the time. I see y'all at least three times a week. Some of you, I see more than that when we do our fellowship and things like that. We see each other more than we see our own family. So when we have to switch churches or we have to do this or people decide to leave and things like that, it always hurts. It doesn't get any easier. That's why I'm so glad I can't wait till we get to that fair land where there'll be no parting and there'll be no dying and there'll, there'll be no separation. We can go see each other anytime that we want to. But that's next week's message. We can't get there yet, amen? We got to be patient. I got to be patient. Quit trying to preach it. Losing people and losing friends is just a sad part of life. And we don't want to lose anybody. I don't like it when somebody says, well, I'm moving so I ain't going to be able to see you. And by the way, I understand you say, oh, well, y'all can talk. Well, that ain't the same. People live near you. You go out to lunch together. You go out and you do things. You, yeah, you know, it's different. A long-distance relationship with friends is different than a close-knit relationship. And you can make it out, how, and all this other sort of stuff, but it is. It's different. It's not the same. Whether it be due to them moving on in life or them dying and going to heaven, it does. It hurts. There's no way to get around those pains. So the reaction that Peter gave Jesus when he told him that he was going to leave would probably have been the same reaction that I gave Jesus if he told me the same thing. I'd have probably said, well, Jesus, if you're going, I'm going. I done told my wife. I said, if you ever leave me, I'm following you. So wherever you go, I'm going. You leave me, I'm following you wherever you go. 
She already knows she's going to have a stalker if she ever divorced from me. <laughs> but that's the attitude that Peter had. Well, Lord, if you're leaving me, I'm going wherever you're going. I ain't going to stay behind. Lord, I'll lay my life down for you. Lord, what he's saying by that, we often think, oh, well, I'll die for you. That's not necessarily what he was saying. Peter was ready and willing to die for the Lord. If you remember in just a little while, in just a few chapters over, he's getting ready to chop a man's ear off just for arresting the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter did mean what he said. I believe he meant it. And, and I believe uh, that, and we'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me not go there. By his reaction, we learn three facts about Peter. Number one, I want us to look at verse 36 and 37. Look at it again with me. Verse number 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot why can I, cannot I follow thee now? He said, why can't I follow you now? I want you to notice, number one, Peter was impatient. You say, how do you get that? Jesus said he was going to get there. You notice that verse number 36? He said, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now. Oh, don't that sound like you and I? Jesus said, you can't have this now. But I want it now, Lord. I want it right now. I don't want to wait. I want growth now. I want this now. I want that now. And Jesus says, it ain't happening yet. You got to wait on it. You got to keep on serving. You got to keep on fighting. You got to keep on pushing. He said, it'll come, but you got to wait on it. Oh my, we are so impatient. Peter said, Lord, where are you going? Jesus responds by saying, he didn't tell him where he was going. Y'all notice that? Right. He didn't answer the question. Peter said, where are you going? He said, where I'm going, you can't go right now. But you'll be able to go later. Peter said, well, Lord, why can't I follow you now? <laughs> That's my attitude every time. The Lord says, you can't have this now, but I want it now. I don't want to wait. I don't want to wait. He totally ignored the fact that Jesus said that they would be together later. Isn't that what we do? That's what we do. If that doesn't describe some of us, I don't know what does. The Lord says you can have that later. And instead of taking him at his word, we try everything we can to get it now. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure it happens. I done prayed. I know it's in God's will. So let's get it done. But what if it's not God's time? And we rush. And we make a mess of things. Because we're trying to do what we want. Which is what God wants. But not at the time that God wants. Lord says you can have it later. But you can't have it now. I think of children. You tell them they can't have something. Or they can't do something. And you know what the first question they always ask is? Why? Miss Evelyn hit the nail right on the head. Why? Why? That was me. I'll be honest with you. I know most of you grew up in a generation where if you asked why, you got beat. That's why you never asked why. And then there's those of you that said, well, I knew it was going to happen. If I said why, I'd get beat. I'm like, well, how do you know that? Well, I never asked. Well, you knew because you've done it before. That's how you know. You do. You learn by doing. You said, well, I want to. Pow! I didn't tell you to speak. That's how some of y'all were raised. You're laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> Why? Don't back talk me. It's the way our parents, some of our parents were. Everybody else has one. Where everybody else is doing it. You know, that was the remark that I'd always say. Well, if everybody else is jumping off a bridge, you're going to do it? And then I'd say, if there's enough water underneath the shore. <laughs> I'd get beat all the time, man. I just didn't know how to control that tongue when I was little. I had a remark for everything. I still do as an adult. Some of y'all know by talking to me, that's the way I am. Well, everybody else is doing it. It's not fair. That's not fair, Mama. Everybody else gets to go out late at night. Why can't I? That ain't fair. My sister don't have to do any chores. Why do I? That ain't fair. I don't understand it. And that's the way we are as adults. When we're talking to the Lord, you see people that are not struggling but they're living in sin, and it's like, man, they just get everything. Lord, I've been praying for this for 15 years, and you ain't give it to me. Why, Lord, why? Lord says, because you're going to get it one day, you just got to wait on it. Yeah. I remember in my mind, as we're traveling, 
back before we got this church. We had prayed for a long time for a church. I didn't even know y'all was looking. And I was traveling for three years trying to trying to figure out where God wanted us, and here you were. Y'all probably wasn't ready for us, and we probably wasn't ready for you then. God knew exactly what he was doing. But in my mind, every church I'd go to preach to, this is it. Praise God. This is going to be the church that we're going to get. And went to a big church. I said, praise God, this is going to be the church we're going to get. Preach there for a month. No, that ain't it. Go to a small church. Praise God, this is going to be it. No, that ain't it. Go to another church. Praise God, they're looking for a preacher. This is going to be it. No, that ain't it. And God knew exactly what I needed. Amen. He knew exactly Amen. what you needed. Amen. We had to wait on it. We had to wait on it. Anytime I asked why, I always got the most famous answer. Because I said so. Amen. Why have I got to wait, Lord? Why can't we have it now? Because I said so. It's that simple. Sometimes that's the only answer to give. It's because I know what's best. And because I said so. Sometimes we just have to quit being impatient and accept things as they are. Simply because he said so. That's the hardest thing to do. Peter doesn't see it now. And sure, all of us are looking forward to go to heaven. Of course you are. Peter, I mean, what's better than being with the Lord, right? But had Peter, the Lord took him with him to heaven when he died. You know what Peter would have missed out on? He would have missed out on the day of Pentecost. He would have missed out on being being able to preach and get credit for those 3,000 souls that were saved that day underneath. And boy, when you study the life of Peter, he was, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute, but he failed. He failed miserably. But all those experiences led up to where he went. And in our life, when we get impatient, we try to push everything and we try to say, well, we're going to do it uh, when we want to do it. It messes things up. Right. He would have never reached his full potential here on earth. And maybe 3,000 people wouldn't have got saved. You think about it like that, now you're like, well, wait a minute. Maybe I've got more work to do before the Lord's going to call me home. Amen. You say, I'm ready to go. Trust me, I'm ready. If the Lord come back tonight, it would not bother me one bit. Lord, come quickly. Hurry up and get here. We're waiting on you. But we've still got a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of people that are lost that need the gospel. So if the Lord doesn't come back tonight, that's why he wants us to go out. He'll come when he's good and ready. And he'll make sure that we go to heaven when it's time for us to go to heaven. But you ain't going before that time, amen. amen. He would have never written first and second Peter. We wouldn't even have that recorded today. Had Jesus or God give Peter what he wanted, which was to be in heaven. So many times in life, because of our impatience, we miss out on the everyday things that God blesses us with. You say, what do you mean by that? I'll give you the perfect example. Every one of us was this way. And if you deny it, you're lying. As we're growing up, about seven years old. Man, I wish I had this. I wish I was old enough to do this. I wish I was old enough to play with the big kids. Wish I was old enough to do soccer and all that other stuff. Okay, you get to that age, you start school. You're in the third grade. And as you're sitting by your desk, you're looking at the clock saying, when is 2.30 going to get here? When is 2.30 going to get here? When is 2.30 going to get here? Oh, Lord, I can't wait till I graduate so I ain't got to go through school. Lord, school's getting on my nerves. Then you're finally in middle school and the same thing. When's 3 o'clock going to get here? Oh, I'm tired of homework. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. When's 3 o'clock going to get here? I can't wait to graduate high school. Then you go to high school. And by that time, I was looking at the clock saying, man, when is lunch going to get here? Uh -huh. Man, when is lunch going to get here? You know, we had the good lunches. We got that back before uh Miss Obama said, decided that she was going to put the healthy stuff in the schools. Uh, but we had pizza and we had chicken sandwiches. I'm talking about them things was almost better than Chick-fil-A. We had French fries and we got to eat good when I was in school. Casey's yeah. back there shaking his head like he knows what I'm talking yeah. about. Kendall has no idea what good lunch is at school. I promise you that. Rose, she eats at school lunch. She knows what it's like. It ain't nothing. She says, man, it ain't like what we grew up on. <laughs> we got the good stuff. I'll be ready for lunch. And then after lunch, man, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready for summer. I'm ready for school to be out. I'm ready for this. I'm ready for that. You graduate to high school. You say, man, I can't wait to get my license. I can't wait to drive a car. I can't wait to do this. So you go, you get your license, and you're excited. 
by that time you're 17, 18, then you're saying, man, I can't wait to be 21. Man, I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to do that. You turn 21. Man, I can't wait to get married. Man, I can't wait to find a wife. Man, I can't wait to find a husband. All our life, mm -hmm. we're wanting to grow. We're wanting to go. We're mm -hmm. in a hurry to get things done, and we just don't know why. I think that's a song, ain't it? Yeah. <laughs> 20, you get married, you have a child, you're holding that baby, and you say, man, I wish this thing would stop crying. Man, I wish this thing would grow up so it stopped crying. Finally, that baby gets old enough where it's not crying all the time. And then you, you get to the terrible twos or the terrible threes, and then you're like, boy, I can't wait for this attitude to stop. I can't wait for this <laughs> child to grow up so it won't have such a bad attitude. Then full rotten twos and three-year-olds, and then they get to be teenagers. And you're like, man, I can't wait to get them out of my house so I ain't got to pay for high school. Man, I ain't got to pay for the school lunch every day. I ain't got to pay for books. I ain't got to pay for that. Lord, help us. we got to pay for college. Then by the time they're grown, you're looking back and you're thinking, mm. where has time flown? Yeah. 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 Why is that? Because we're so impatient. Mm -hmm. That's life yeah. for all of us. We miss out on everything in between because we're always concentrating on what we want because we're impatient. One really good one for us adults, and then I'm moving on to give you another example. You're at work on Monday morning. You get there. Oh, it's 6 o'clock. All right, let's get this work day started. And you've been working for about five minutes, and you look up. All right, is an hour past five yet? Is it o'clock yet? No, it's been only five minutes. Oh, Lord. I got the rest of the week. It's only my day. It's only been five minutes. Oh, Lord. Lunchtime comes, and you say, I'm halfway there. This day's halfway over. By Wednesday, you're saying, I only got two more days of this mess left. Yes, I only got two more days of this mess left. Then by Friday, it's, praise God, the weekend's here. And you turn around, and the weekend's gone. Yeah, I know, right? right? What happened? It's life. Yeah. We're impatient. We miss out on so many things. Like Peter would have missed out on just because he wanted to be with Jesus. And I'm, I'm with you. Being with Jesus, there ain't nothing better than that. But the Lord's got to work for us to do down here. We've got to put on some land. Yeah. Can't get blinded by what heaven's going to be like. We'll get blinded next week. We'll go to worship next Sunday night. But we're not there yet. Then you say, well, I need somebody to watch the kids. You let somebody else watch the kids while you're off doing it. And then you, they grow up and it's like, man, all the time I've missed. All the time I, I, I could have done this. I could have done that. And then that time's gone. They say the older that you get, the faster time flies, and I'm learning that. The older, I mean, it seems like just yesterday that I was 18, and I was in high school, running the road. That's what, I mean, you turn around, and it's like, well, I can only imagine how some of you feel that are years down the road, and you're like, I was only 18 last week. Really, it was 30 or 40 years ago. <laughs> kids, they can't wait to grow up, and parents can't wait for the kids to move out. And then by the time they move out, you've missed so much. That's the way life is. We miss out on so much simply because we do not live in the moment. Amen. Sometimes, I, I, and, and I was talking to somebody, I don't remember who, somebody here, we was talking about the church and growth and all those things. And uh, we said within a few years, we see the church maybe busting out the same Lord willing. We're praying. We're within five years. So hopefully, we're praying that the Lord will have this thing built up to where it needs to be. Yeah. But until that time, we need to live right now and enjoy it. Yeah. Even through the hard times. Even through the growing pains. I think of last year when we had vacation Bible school. And this place was packed to the to the rafters. Like, if we had a balcony, it would have been full. This place was full. We didn't have any room. We had 20 adults back here in the nursery. Actually, it was about 25 adults by the end of the week. We were packed in there like sardines. And you know what? <laughs> Those are growing pains, but they're good pains. We had a good time together while I was walking around saying, we need to build a building. We need to build a building. We need to fill this thing up before we do it. Yeah. 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 Not only fill it up, but keep it full. Yes. We can't get ahead of God. We can't be impatient. We've got to live in the now. Live in the now. Number two, I said number one, Peter was impatient. Number two, Peter had to wait to grow. 
Look at verse number 37, the second part of that verse. First part says, Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow, why can I follow thee now? And he said, I will lay down my life for thy sake. Peter's next comment, that I will lay down my life for thy, for thy sake, it was practical. That's what it was. It, and you can't sum it up any other way. When I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I'm willing to give everything up for you. That's a prideful statement. You know why it is? Because that confidence is in me and what I can do. Let's be honest tonight. When we make a statement like that, I'll do whatever it takes. That's right in us. And I've said that before and I meant it. But that's a prideful heart. He had a little bit of pride there. He said, I will lay down my life for you, Lord. He was trying to let Jesus know how much he loved him, how much he cared for him. How many times have you said that? Lord, I'll do whatever you want. Lord, I'll meet any need that you have. Lord, I promise I'll do this. It's kind of the attitude, the mindset that Peter had. No one questions whether Peter loved the Lord or not. He was always the first one to jump in and fight for the Lord. I mean, we said a minute ago, he chopped off a man's ear simply because he was going to arrest Jesus. I'd say that's a man that's willing to go for it all. That's a man that's willing to give it all up. That's a man that, and you know, he was a professional fisherman. That's what he did for his living. And Jesus said, well, if you quit doing what you're doing and turn it over here to this side, then you might be able to catch some fish. And you know what in Peter's head? I'm sure he probably thought, now Jesus. I've been doing this since I was a little kid. I've been fishing these waters for 30-something for years. Jesus, I know where to put the net down at. Do you know what he did? He put the net down. And you know what happened? The fish filled the boat. So many that the boat almost sank, if you study that out. So he done what Jesus said. He made sacrifices for the Lord. I believe we all should have that zeal that Peter had. I believe we ought to be willing to fight for the Lord. I believe we ought to be willing to stand up. And say what needs to be said in this world when everybody's so quiet and timid and scared. Because Peter would have been the first person to step up and say something. I believe, really, Peter was a redneck. Amen. He probably was the most redneck of all the disciples. He's the one that his mouth got him in the most trouble, usually. He said what was on his mind. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes you need to learn when to be quiet. The problem was Peter was fighting when he didn't need to. It takes spiritual growth to get to the place... That you know when to fight and when to wait. I can't tell you since I've been pastoring how many times I've wanted to get into a, not get into a physical fight. But I've wanted to fight and do things and do this and do that. And the Lord said, you do that and you're going to mess things up. Right. Step back. Let me have it. They're my people anyway. <laughs> Y'all ain't my people. Y'all his people. I ain't going to deal with you accordingly. Yeah. I used to be the type of person that would just tell the truth no matter where I was. I'd speak my mind, and sometimes I still do. It didn't matter if it offended. But as I've grown in the Lord, I've learned I can't always say the things that come straight from my mind. Yeah. Y'all say, man, can you imagine what I don't say while I'm up here? Because a lot of times I do say directly what comes from my mind. But I hope by the Lord you have no idea. You have no idea. You think, man, if he holds something back, I'd like to hear that. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't want to hear it. Sometimes it's best to let people believe what they want and let God prove them wrong. Amen. That's the hardest thing to do, especially when you care for somebody. Because you can only tell somebody so many times, and if they're not going to listen, they're not going to listen. Right. And I know that we have a hard time discerning on when we should give up or when we should, should say something or when we shouldn't say something. Here's a good way to figure it out. You say, Jesus had mercy on Peter. And that's right, he did have mercy on Peter. Peter had a few bad days. Judas died and went to hell. <laughs> Judas did not have a few bad days. Judas had a bad heart. When somebody's got a bad heart, there's nothing you can do about it other than pray. That's it. And the Lord's got to deal with them. And there's times in our life when we want to fix things and we want to fix people, and we can't because right. it's not time for those people to be fixed. Because when God's ready for them, their eyes will open and they'll fix themselves Amen. with his help. The growth, that growth can only come over time when you're concerned between the two. Should I say something? Should I keep my mouth shut? Should I just not do anything at all? That's spiritual growth that comes over time. Every preacher wants to do big things for God when he calls them. 
but no preacher is ready to preach as soon as they're called. Boy, you ever, if you see me when I was 16, when I was 17, when I first got called to preach, I wasn't ready to pastor a church. Do you know what I wanted to do at that time? Pastor a church. You know why? Because God put that calling in my heart. From the time he called me to preach, I've always had that burning desire to pastor and to do what I'm doing. And I certainly wasn't ready back then. Mm -hmm. And some of you, you got a desire to do something, but spiritually you're not ready to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It takes training. It takes studying. As soon as we get saved, we want to begin working for the Lord. Wish we had some more young people here tonight. They're the ones that need this one. If God knew where we was at. As soon as we get saved, we want to begin working for the Lord. Then we try to do everything. I've seen it many, 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 many times. I've been in the ministry for 15 years. Somebody will get saved. They'll get excited. They'll have good zeal about them. And they'll, 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 they'll start ushering. And they'll start singing in the choir. And they'll start doing this. And they'll start doing that. And they'll start working here. And they'll, they'll have about eight jobs in the church. And within two or three months, they say, well, this is beginning to be too much. Nobody else is doing anything. It's wearing me out. I'm tired. And you know what? They burn out. And within a year, they're gone to the next church. Or they're gone out of church completely because they took on too much. You've got to understand you can't take on too much. You've got to give some things to other people. Okay? Sometimes you're just not ready to do certain things. When you take on too much at one time, you get burned out. So most of your new converts leave. Because they try not to do, they try to do too much. We must wait patiently and grow in the Lord. That's like a flower. I'm learning this since we've had our little flower bed. My rose gets on me all the time. She's got this little cactus, and I was watering it every day. She didn't know, you know. You give it too much water, you kill it. Amen. I'm out there giving it some water every day. You ain't supposed to water things once a month. If they start to turn into things, she said, what are you doing? You're killing the flowers. And that's the same thing with us. We get too much water, we ain't going to grow. We just going to die. Too much water makes you stagnant sometimes. We need to wait on the Lord to sprout us out. Number three, and we're going to the house. Look with me at verse number 38. Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Peter had to fail before he could succeed. Well, that's a hard lesson to learn. Amen. The way you learn most times is by failure. Amen. Failure will teach you a lot in life. We all know the story. Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times. And Peter got to hang out with the wrong crowd. By the way, that will do it every single time. Time. You get to hanging around the wrong crowd, they'll draw you in faster than the church can draw you out of a mess. Yeah. That's the way that it works. Because he was with them and made it easier to deny Christ. You do realize he was hanging out with the same soldiers that crucified Jesus. That night they were trying to find out Jesus. They come to Peter and they said, do you know the Lord Jesus? And Peter said, no, I don't know who that guy is. Then another person said, you look just like one of his disciples. Don't you know Jesus? Peter, the same guy that was willing to cut a man's ear off, the same man that was willing to jump and say, I'm ready to risk my life, is now in the hole saying, no, I don't know Jesus. That proves it can happen to any of us. Why, you be very careful. And then the third time they come up to him, and they said, do you know Jesus? No, I don't know that blankety blank Jesus, and don't ask me again. He even cussed, according to the Bible. He cussed while he denied Jesus. Say, Peter, Peter, one of the disciples, Peter. See, Peter was not really ready to give all the Christ. He had to go through some failures. He had to go through some heartaches. He had to go through some trials. He had to go through some troubles. You say, why is our church facing troubles and trials? Because we didn't grow in faith. Right. And in order to grow, we got to fail a little bit. Hey, as your pastor, can I shock you real quick? You, some of you may not be shocked. I might have already done it. I'm going to fail you. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect. I never will be perfect until I get to heaven. And by the way, you're going to fail me. You're not perfect. Mm -hmm. We ought to love each other through our failures, love each yeah. other while we're growing together yeah. as Christians. Peter did do great things for Jesus. He did eventually do as he promised. He did eventually give his life for Christ. He was hung upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to 
to die the death that Jesus Christ died. So he died the same death. The only difference is they hung him upside down on the cross because he said, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus died. So he did get to make that. He did keep that promise. Lord, I'll give my life for you. But he had to go through some things first. He had to go through some things. He had to fail to get there. Don't be impatient with your failures. So many times, that's the one thing that aggravates us. We mess up and we say, oh Lord. I ain't never going to recover from that. How am I ever going to get out of that? You know what? The Lord will help you every single time. The fact that you fail is a good thing. Because if you did not fail, that meant you were perfect. You know what? Jesus didn't die for perfect people. He died for lost sinners. And the fact that you're failing and you're making mistakes, and the fact that you feel bad about it shows you that the Spirit is working in your heart and in your life. Jack Howells. One of the greatest preachers ever made the comment. He said, failure plus 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 failure. Y'all get the picture? Equals success. Eventually, you'll get it right. It may take some failure and some times of trials and troubles. Eventually, you'll get it right. Eventually. Peter got it right. In closing... Let's not be impatient when it comes to serving the Lord. Let's not be impatient when it comes to growing. Not only with each other. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we get impatient with each other while we're growing. We shouldn't get impatient because others aren't growing as well as we think they should. And at the same time, we shouldn't get impatient with ourselves while we're growing. When we mess up. Let's not be impatient when it comes to our failures. It took him six days to make the sun, the moon, and the stars, Jupiter and Mars. But he's still working on me. Amen. Amen. Y'all stand up. April, you come to the piano. Give us an opportunity to respond. To-